I decided to get into editing specifically because when I was in film school, you know, they'd always do this thing at the beginning of the year where they say, everyone who wants to be a director, raise your hand. And the whole class inevitably raised their hand. And being a strategic, long-term thinking person, I said, okay, well, then if this is the standard, I'm going to be going up against the same kind of jobs as everyone in this classroom. And I'd already sort of fallen in love with editing through some of my school projects. So I, when they said, who wants to be an editor, and my hand was the only one who went up, I thought, oh, good. Then I, I won't be competing against everyone in the world. And, and I love this. Like, I love doing this. So let's, let's go towards this. And I did. And I've never looked back. And I've never been you know, distressed or, or doubted that decision. It was, it's been nothing but fun. Editing animation is a different animal entirely. You're far more involved in the development of the story and developing and crafting the story as it goes along. You're dealing with different types of media, so you're not just getting having a script that delivers you know, footage to your door. You're actually deciding what that footage is going to be, and you have input, and you collaborate with the director, the storyboard artist, the layout department, and the animators, and you, you don't, you're not passive at all. You have a dialogue going the entire time. You can say, I think I need a shot like this, or this beat isn't landing for me just right. Why don't we try drawing it like this? And so you're in conversation with these departments all the time. When it comes to storytelling, I, I tend to go on instinct and, and go with my gut and what feels right and what pacing and rhythm and, and what arc feels good, where emotionally I want things to land. But that comes from years of being an assistant and being in this business and spending time watching other people work, working with great mentors and people who are really generous enough to bring me into their suite and let me watch them work, to give me scenes to cut and giving me feedback. Because when you do start out, you're, it is sort of magical and, and it feels like everyone's got a manual of how to edit that you just don't understand. But that comes with experience, and, and you can learn the software and you can learn the technology, but the aesthetic and the, the more intangible bits of storytelling you get from really doing it day after day, year after year, and being surrounded by really great storytellers. At Pixar, we are surrounded by the top people who are all passionate about what they do and super creative and friendly people. So we all sit down at the table together, and I've learned so much from everyone there and everyone I worked at worked with before I was at Pixar, just really wonderful editors who took time to show me how they thought things through and how they made their cuts work and flow. And I've absorbed all of that and, and take it forward and try to give back whenever I can. If I've got an assistant or someone who's interested in taking a look at the process and, and seeing what I do, and it, it's, it, it just cycles through that way. I edit on Media Composer because it's been, besides being just a really wonderful tool and something I can count on, most of the jobs I've been on have used it, so there's a continuity to it where I can count on it. You get, get involved with other systems and they come and go, and that can be really disruptive. You know, stepping onto a job and they've got a new editing system that's a flash in the pan and you're trying to learn it. If you're trying to learn the software and the interface every single time, it's hard to be creative because you're just trying to learn something new. So. I personally appreciate the continuity that Avid has had over my entire career. I've stepped in on other systems, but Avid has been sort of the benchmark and the one I could count on to be there. And in terms of the flexibility of the tool, I use more of the effects tools doing storyboard editing than most people would suspect that I do. And a lot of times, working on Piper, the director is an animator, and he would joke that I was going to be animating at any moment. He's like, well, we don't need to send it to animation or back to story. Sarah can just do it right here, because I can go in and I can repaint. I can use the animat and pull things out and move characters around, adjust eyes, change the background. I can do all those things right there to sort of pre-visit quickly before we send it down the pipe where it's going to be more expensive to render out. Piper is a short film that's going to be featured on the front of Finding Dory, and it's about a sandpiper, a baby sandpiper, who is learning to go out in the world and leave the nest for the first time. This was my first time uh, leading a short project at Pixar and being the only editor and not really having other editors um, doing any of the work for me. And I very heavily felt that responsibility on this show, that if anything wasn't smooth and there was any lack of flow or any bumps in the storytelling, there was going to be no one to blame but me. 
Um, and my responsibility as the lead editor on this project meant that I had to follow it from the story all the way through to the very end when we have final renders and the final sound mix to make sure that every intention I had was realized because not everybody knows what the intention is and they aren't always thinking about rhythm and flow the way I am. There's a lot of water in Piper and there's a lot of movement of flocks of birds back and forth and I put a great deal of thought and attention into the timing of those elements because they're characters. Piper has no dialogue. Uh, so it's all nonverbal storytelling and so that rhythm and that flow of every element of the environment is really important to the pacing. So I had to communicate with the downstream departments and the effects departments and lighting and animation to explain that you know the water coming in and out should feel like breathing. You know, the, the bird can't flap its wings too close to the edit point because it's going to be jarring as we jump across the cut. I had to keep in mind all of those things because that was my responsibility. And that's essentially what a lead editor does at Pixar. Besides crafting the story, they really have to watch and care for the film all the way through to the end. Because animation is so expensive, they really discourage, if, they, if you can, going in and doing too much fine tuning of the cut after everything's, everything has been finally rendered. You might have some flexibility to take frames off head and tail, but anything that's going to lead to re-rendering a shot, it better be worth it. And there was a point, it, it maybe two-thirds of the way through where I went through and said mm, I need more frames on these opening shots and because the technology that was being used in the animation and simulation and effects departments was constantly being tweaked and dialed in throughout the process I felt very strongly that after they had sort of nailed it I needed more frames to be able to accommodate what I wanted to see happen with the wave structure and with the pacing of the film and and I went to battle for it and and they agreed with me ultimately, but it, it, was a, it wasn't a choice to, to make lightly because it did cost money. I think what makes great animation is not just something that makes you feel in the moment, and that's really important. You want to feel something. If it can invoke any kind of emotion and sentiment, that's, that's what we're going for. But like any great film, if I'm still thinking about it when I leave the theater, if I'm still thinking about it a week later, if it gets inside me and it's under my skin and it becomes part of me, if it inspires me to think about new creative ways of storytelling or new visuals that I hadn't thought of before, that's, that's the stuff that sticks with you. And I think as filmmakers and, and really when you're dealing with animation, we're, we're painters and we're we're really trying to get something that's going to stay throughout the years and something that, you, that every generation will go back to and find enjoyment from. It, it's something that has legs. It's got longevity. It, it isn't just a, a, a momentary giggle. It's something that you really chew on for a long time and, and shapes you in a way.